Let me ask you a question before we get started. How many of you guys are familiar with, with DISC as a behavioral uh, tool? Anybody familiar with that? <clears throat> okay, terrific. Um, how many have ever had your DISC done and you know what your behavioral style is? Okay, I see a couple of hands there as well. That's good stuff. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about what DISC is for those of you who aren't as familiar. We're going to talk a little bit about what it is and, and why it's so important as a communication tool. This is a session here that is, is not exclusively to real estate sales, so I want to be clear about that. This is a session that's just talking about how to understand behavioral style as a way of enhancing your communication right, with other folks. And then we can talk about how that plays out in the real estate setting, right? how that plays out. But uh, what I want to start with is I asked everyone to uh, download. There was a handout for the session today. Um, I sent the handout with the first email. I sent the second email yesterday with the handout. Does everybody have the handout, which is the number sheet? All right. Do you have the handout? Okay. So here's, I want to make sure if you, if you need a second to get that printed out, because we're going to go with that handout in just a moment. But today, here's what we're going to focus on. We're going to learn about yourself. We're going to learn about your own communication style. We're going to learn about others. We're going to learn what makes you unique in your communication with other folks, right? What makes you unique? We're going to talk about the strengths of each different behavioral style and, and ultimately how you can build on those strengths to improve your communication. I see a chat light come on and I suspect, oh, it's Alex. Okay, terrific. Alex put his contact into chat. So the very first thing that I asked folks to do was to print out the number sheet and it looks suspiciously like this one right here. Okay, everybody have this sheet? If you don't have the sheet, then what you can do is you can just go ahead and do this right on the screen. All right, but here's the exercise that I want you to, to pay attention to. What I want you to do, in fact, here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna do this on the screen first. We're gonna do this exercise by watching. Um, now, you know what? I'm gonna change it up. We're gonna do it on paper. We've gotta do it on paper. Here's what we're looking to do. On this sheet are numbers that go from one, I believe, to 90. What I'm gonna ask you to do in 45 seconds, and I'm gonna set my clock here, I'm going to set my clock to 45 seconds. In 45 seconds, I want you to circle as many numbers as you can find in sequential order. Find the number one, circle it, then move to number two, circle it, move to number three, find number three, circle it, then go to find number four and circle it. And in 45 seconds, I want you to get to as many numbers as you can. We all good? Follow the instructions here. We know what we're trying to accomplish. All right, here we go. I'm going to start my clock. Are you ready? Get set, go. I'm gonna start the countdown timer now. All right, we're down to 30 seconds. Twenty seconds. Fifteen. Ten seconds. And we're going to be at five, four, three, two, one. All right. There's the timer. We are done. 45 seconds. Now, here's what I want you guys to do. Stop that. I'm going to put you all in gallery mode now for a second here because I want to be able to see all of you guys, right? I want to find out how many people, quick show of hands, and I'd love for you to open up your cameras here so that I can see you. And if you're not able to put your camera open, then you can just go ahead and raise your hand on Zoom. But quick show of hands, how many people got to 10 numbers? Okay, we'll keep your hands up if you got to 10. How about 15? If you didn't get to 15, lower your hand. People are still at 15. How about 20? 20, that's good, 25. 30. All right, we're starting to lose. All right, do I have anybody left? All right, let's go back. We had some 25s. How about 26? How many people got to 26? Uh, how about 20? All right, there's a 26 there. Anybody get to 27? No. All right, 26 is the winner there. Who's, uh, 
Who is that that's there at 26? Unmute yourself because I don't see your name. It's Scott. Oh, it's Scott. There you go. It's Scott is Scott. How are you? Yeah, All right. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. Now, 26, pretty good in 45 seconds. Now that you've had a chance to do it, though, I'm going to ask you to try to do it again. And here's how we're going to change it up. What I want you to do is I want you to take that paper. And if you look at the top here, do you see how there's a little tick mark here right by the 66? and a little tick mark here on the bottom right by the 52. And then on the sides, there's one over here and one over here. What I want you to do is I want you to draw lines across just like that, connecting those little hash marks so that we've got four different quadrants, okay? Now, everybody got that done? Or you can look at it right on the screen here. Now, what if I told you that if the, you looked for the number one, it would be up in the upper left quadrant right there. And the number two would be in the next quadrant over to the right. The number three would be down in the bottom right quadrant. The number four would be on the bottom left quadrant. The number five would be back up in the right corner. Do you see a pattern forming here? All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. Now that I've given you the great number game hack, I'm gonna go back 45 seconds on the clock here. I'm gonna start this again, and in 45 seconds, I'm gonna ask you to do it again and see if you can better your score. Remember the pattern, number one in the left, number two to the right, number three in the bottom right, number four to the bottom left. We're gonna to try to do this again, and we're gonna set the timer for 45 more seconds. Are you ready, set, here we go now. Clock is running. Down to 40. What are, number are we starting on? I'm sorry. Mike. Starting with number one. Up. Starting with number one and just doing okay. the same game. We're down to 25. 20. 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, I feel like it's New Year's Eve. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, let's put down the pens. Quick show of hands. How many people got a better score? All right, how many people got a worse score? All right. Let me ask you this, and just, just unmute yourself now, guys. Just unmute yourself. Was it easier knowing what to expect in terms of the pattern flow? Did it make it easier if you knew where to look, right? Yes. And it's really fascinating. Yeah. It does, right? It, it's yes. just when you have all this big array of numbers and you're trying to find the one and then you're looking all over the place for the number two, if you know what to expect, it just makes it easier, right? Pattern recognition makes life so much easier. And Let's just, just look at this for a second. Here's the six, right? If I was to give you this picture, would you know what kind of animal you're looking at simply by the pattern of their stripes? Would you be able to guess? Yes. Yeah, most of us would, right? You look at this pattern and you start to see that you've got a tiger, you've got a Dalmatian, and you've got a giraffe, you've got a zebra. Just by looking at this pattern, there's no big surprise here at the animals that we're looking at. Well, what does this have to do with anything? You know, the same holds true, guys, with people. When you become aware of the predictable patterns of what to expect in people's behavior and what to expect in the way that, we, that people communicate, it just makes communication much easier. So, so let me ask you, do you know anybody who is somebody who's very direct, somebody who, who kind of is driven, gets things done, hard driving, Anybody know any direct driven people? Quick show of hands if you know some people like that in your life. Okay, terrific. How about this? Do you know folks who are kind of fun to be around? They're encouraging, they're the life of the party. They're great storytellers. They've always got a joke. Anybody know anybody like that, right? Now that person would probably be what we would call I wired. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. This guy here, the driver is D-wired. 
you're going to see the DISC acronym, D-I-S-C. The D is the driver. The person who's kind of the fun life of the party is the I-wired person. How about this? Anybody know anybody who is just a good team player? They're loyal, they're dedicated, they're steady, they're kind of the backbone uh, of, of, of a team or your family. Anybody know any good, just salt of the earth, rock solid folks like that, the S wired folks? Anybody know anybody like that? Okay. Or how about this detail oriented, organized, neat structured they don't really see crowds they're they're kind of sometimes a little quiet they're very detail focused how many of you have any experience with any detail oriented people in your life quick show of hands okay so here's the thing guys all of us are kind of a combination of all of these styles driven in the i the interpersonal s the steady c we call that the compliant and we're going to talk about all these styles in a second. We are a mixture of all of these. And when we do behavioral style like this, we're not doing this in an effort to try to put people in boxes, right? This is not about putting people in boxes and saying you are always this or you are always that. But what we're looking to do is if we can start to find the predictable patterns, right? What we know is that people are different, but they are predictably different, right? So let's talk about behavioral, just kind of studying behavioral studies from, this has been something we've been trying to figure out human beings since the beginning of time. If you go back to 440 roughly BC, you know, a guy by the name of Empedocles, I don't know why his mama named him that, but she did. Empedocles, what he believed is that people's behavior was driven by the elements, earth, wind, fire, water, all of those things. And he believed that it was those elements that kind of were determinants in terms of people's behavior. About 50 years later, Hippocrates came along and what Hippocrates said is, no, it's not the elements that drives the way people behave, it's the fluids inside of our bodies, right? And he started to talk about uh, different personality types as maybe being uh, choleric or, or phlegmatic. And it was all based on bodily fluids, right? That was in the 400s BC. Fast forward all the way up into the 1920s, a guy by the name of Carl Jung, some of you may know of Carl Jung, famous psychologist, psychoanalyst, and what he developed was a system that kind of took this a little bit deeper. And he's known for sort of giving birth to a different kind of behavioral profiling tool called the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Some of you, anybody familiar with Myers-Briggs? Have any familiarity with that? And he talks about people's behavior kind of on four different continuums of sort of thinking and feeling and sensing and intuition. Well, all of that's great. It's just hard to work with. It was Dr. William Martson in 1928 who kind of started to take a look at all of this information and start to say, hey, can we kind of think about this in a practical way that we can really use? And in 1928, he published a book called Emotions of Normal People. Right, so let me just stress this. This is not a psychological test. This is just behavior of normal people. And what he decided was, based on all the data that we had, that people kind of behaved in, in ways that would be more aligned with sort of dominance, D, influence, S, steadiness of personality, S, uh, influence was the I, steadiness, S, C, compliance, right? All of these things. And he kind of gave birth to the DISC tool, the type uh, tool that we use today. So we've been studying behavior, human behavior, since the beginning of time. And here's a couple of things that just kind of give you an overview before we get into the different styles. You know, what shapes our personality? Behavior is an outgrowth of personality. I've, I've worked with DISC and Myers-Briggs for many, many, many years. Some of you may know my previous life as a psychotherapist. It was really my first job out of college, out of graduate school. I was, I was a, a family therapist. And, and one of the things you know about behavior is it kind of flows from our personalities, right? And, and your personality evolves over time, right? What we, what we know is that as a child, your personality can change. A six-year-old's personality become very different by the time they get to middle school and then different again in high school. And, and what we know is that there's a lot of things that impact your personality formation, your, 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 the structure of that, but, but your behavior tends to flow consistent with your personality type. The things that influence that are heredity, certainly genetics plays a part in that, right? What kind of temperament you inherit, 
from mom and dad plays a part of that. The environment that you find yourself in plays a part of your personality. Definitely the role models that you've had in your life, all these different things shape our personality and out of that personality, our behavior grows. So what is DISC? Well, DISC is actually a survey. It's not a psychological test. What we do is we actually ask you to complete a survey of answering specific questions and how you answer those questions helps us determine how you score in terms of the D characteristics, the I characteristics, the S characteristics, and the C characteristics. And we're not going to get into the, me the mechanics today of actually doing a DISC, a DISC assessment. And there's lots of different places where you can do them. Right, I am a certified DISC trainer with the John Maxwell uh, Leadership Organization. The DISC tool that I use with folks, it tends to be more focused around your behavior as it relates to leadership. You can go to Tony Robbins' website, the great Tony Robbins personal growth person, and you can do a DISC evaluation on his website, which is kind of more focused on interpersonal relationships. Um, there's lots of different places. And what will happen when you do this assessment is you will get a, a, a grid, a score. We're not going to get too caught up in the scoring today. But based on where you rate, the midline here, just to give you an understanding, the midline here is the, the, is the dividing line between behaviors that are pronounced above the line and a little bit recessive below the line. All of us have all of these characteristics, but for some of us, some are more dominant. And the higher you go, the more dominant that trait, the lower you go, the less dominant that trait. So let's, let's start to dig in a little bit into the, into the different styles. But before I do that, I'm gonna give you just a quick, a quick scenario. Imagine that you are getting onto an elevator, right? The doors close right now, the elevator comes down, the door's just about to open. How many of you are kind of hoping to yourself, please be empty, please be empty, please be empty. I don't want to talk to any crazy person on this elevator. I just want to get in this elevator. And if it's crowded, you're going to kind of keep to yourself. Look down, look at your phone, look at your shoes. Anybody elevator riders like that? Anybody like that? You know, those folks, you know, folks like that are just more reserved in their nature. Now, now let's go the other way. How many people are like, I hope when this door opens up, there's a lot of people in there because we are going to have a party. I just love talking to people. And when I got in the elevator, we're going to have a good time. Anybody like that? Nobody's quite like that either. Okay. Well, those folks are definitely more outgoing, right? And so the temperaments that we start to think about in terms of DISC behavior are people that are outgoing or people that are more reserved. And clearly, you know, there's, there's a preference that all of us have kind of one way or the other. We're either more outgoing or we're more reserved, right? The, out, the empty elevator riders or the, the, the elevator talkers, right? There's a little of each one. How about this? Let me give you a different scenario. How many have ever gone on vacation? How many like to go on vacation? Okay, that's great. I'm hoping that when COVID starts to get under control, we all take a big, long vacation. How many of you are vacation planners, meaning that before you go, you've got things kind of figured out. You know where you're going to go, when you're going to be there. You've got all the details worked out. Any vacation people like that, that they've got it all planned so that they don't miss a thing. Okay. So folks like that tend to be more task-oriented, right? As opposed to how many of you are like, I don't care. We're just going to go. We are going to have fun. I will figure it out when we get there, right? right? So those of you are not as task oriented. Those of you are more um, just kind of relationship people oriented. Now, let me see the task oriented people again. Put your hand up if you were one of the task oriented people. Relationship people, take a good look at them because those are the folks that are gonna get things organized so that you can actually go on vacation and have a good time, right? The rest of us, it's just like, we'll figure it out as we go. We're relationship oriented. And so what it comes down to disc, you know, what it comes down to people, you know, it's, it's very much the same way. How many of you, you can, you can find out simply by asking simple questions, whether you're more task oriented, whether you're more people oriented, 
same question. You can find out by asking people whether you're more detail oriented, uh, all the different things. It's through survey, through well written, well calibrated questions that we can determine what your behavioral style typically looks like. And so here's the four components. We have the D, the I, the S and the C. The Ds and the Is tend to be more outgoing. Whereas the S's and the C's tend to be more reserved, right? Go back to your elevator riders. Empty, ele empty elevator on the bottom, full elevator up on the top, the D's and the I's. Now, to the left and to the right, the D's and the C's tend to be more task oriented. These are the planners. These are the ones who are gonna be focusing on the details, making sure that we've got our vacation mapped out perfectly. The I's and the S's who are more people oriented are just gonna be so excited and thinking about all the people that we're gonna see, all the things that we're gonna do, and they're not really all that concerned about planning, right? So the thing you wanna to start to think about in terms of understanding DISC is these continuums. Outgoing and reserved, task-oriented and people-oriented. Those are sort of the four key areas that you're gonna to wanna to start to think about. Now, let's go a little deeper here. Let's just kind of jump right on in. You know that you're talking to a D. Let's start to think about how you recognize the Ds. In fact, let me, before I do that, I see that the chat light just popped on. I wanna see if there's a question there. Ah, Natalie answered the question with me, 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 right? When we asked one of the questions earlier. All right, here's the thing. You know you're talking to a D. Have you ever gone out to lunch with somebody who insists that they drive? Like the high D is the guy who says, we're all going out to lunch, I'll drive. In fact, what the high D will do is they'll say, I'll drive even if it's your car, I'm gonna drive right? The Ds are people that are uh, seek control. They're very decisive. They're very direct. They're very results oriented. Now, the truth is that Ds make up about 3% of the population. I think that God in God's infinite wisdom said, you know, we need Ds because they're, they're decisive. They get things done. But oh my God, we, we probably have to keep the population down to like 3%. Otherwise, we are just going to be at war with each other all the time. Like if we had a whole planet full of Ds, it would be disastrous. There's another D word, right? How about this? Do you know folks, think of someone in your family, a friend, a colleague, somebody who's fun to be around, somebody who tells great stories. They kind of captivate your attention, right? These are the eye-wired people here. And the thing about the eyes is that they're persuasive, they're very spontaneous, they're very friendly, they love to be in the spotlight. Eyes make up about 11% of the population, right? And, and you know, they, they are great encouragers, great supporters, um, they, they love to be the center of attention. Interestingly enough, they find themselves as trainers who sit in front of a Zoom camera all day because they just kind of like to be out in front, right? And, and that's kind of the nature of what eyes look like. Now, let's keep going. How about S's? They're loyal. You know, they're, they're helpful. They're great team members. They're great listeners. If you've ever had a bad day and you go and you have a good friend, anybody have a good friend? Like when you have a bad day, there's just that one, two, one good friend you can go to and you know that they're always gonna find a way to make you feel better. Anybody have a friend like that? They're just great listeners, right? And those folks are the high S's. Now, you don't want to take your bad day to a high I. You know what happens to a high I? They want to be the center of attention. I'm going to have to mute some folks here. All righty. So what happens is if you have your bad day and you go to a high I and you talk to the high I and say, you know what? My day was so bad. And they're like, you think your day was bad. Let me tell you about my day. And you're like, no. Shut up, you. This was my bad day, right? Now, S's, S's make up 69% of the population. The vast majority of people out there are steadies, S's. They're people-oriented. They're a little bit more reserved, but they're team-oriented. They're great with follow-through. They're great, loyal friends. They're very accepting, right? Now, the next number, the next group, rather, is the C's. Right, these are the detail-oriented. Right, they're you, you know these guys. Their desk is always neat, right? And uh, if you put down your keys on the on the cup, they will come and they'll put them and they'll hang them up because there's a place for everything, right? And um, even their garage, 
You go into their garage, everything is in a box, everything is in a hook. They are just super detail oriented. These are the high C's, the compliance, right? And they make up 17% of the population. If you were a high C, you already knew that because you did the math in your head and said, okay, D's are 3%, I's are 11%. S's are 69%. What's left is 17%. They're so detail oriented and they are very compliant. They're very analytical. They're very good planners. They're very accurate. And I saw in chat, somebody had said, that's all me, right? One of the things that happens sometimes is we have to remember we're a kaleidoscope of all of these behaviors. But for all of us, some one, two, maybe even three tend to be more dominant than others, right? So we think about the percentages of the Ds, the Is, the Ss, and the Cs. Most of the folks that we're gonna come across in our lives are high Ss, although we've got to be aware of all the other styles. Now, let's talk a little bit deeper now. Let's talk about the Ds, right? They're results oriented, they're very active. You know, they're, they're great multitaskers, even though Gary Keller would tell you that multitasking is a lie. You can't do multiple things really, really well, but the Ds will try. They're driven by authority. They want to take control of situations. They'll, they'll, they're open to change if it's going to help them get the results. They're very, very comfortable with direct confrontation. In fact, some of them are very comfortable initiating confrontation, right? They're just that's who they are. They're, they're very, uh, they treasure people to be loyal to them. They, they look for loyalty in the relationships. You know, the greatest fear of the high Ds is the fear of being taken advantage of. The thing that the high Ds are always, always, always trying to make sure of is that they're in control of the situation so people don't get over on them. That is the greatest fear. And it's important to think about these fears because as we're working with these folks in our business, as we're working with folks in sales, if we know that the high Ds are concerned about being taken advantage of, we need to make sure that when we're communicating with them, that they feel in control, that they're feeling like they're not being taken advantage of, right? That's the greatest fear and will cause tension and stress in a relationship. The strengths of the high Ds. There are a couple words here that describe it, right? They can be very, very bold. They're confident. They are decisive. They're very productive. They are very strong-willed folks, independent, positive. They're really good at emergencies. They're very good at getting people to take action, motivating people to take action. They're goal-oriented. They are comfortable leading. Ds have a way of gravitating into leadership roles, and they thrive. Not just tolerate conflict. They thrive on resistance. It makes them stronger. Right. And so D's have a lot of great strengths like this. Now, one of the things that we have to understand about our strengths is that when we overuse a strength or we use a strength in the wrong situation, it actually can become a bit of an obstacle, a bit of a weakness. Uh, I grew up in, a, in my family. My dad was a shop teacher. And what I learned from my dad was that there's a tool for everything. And if you have the right tool, it makes the job easier. If all you have is a hammer and a screwdriver for every home repair, what you're going to find is you're using the wrong tool for the job. And many times when our strengths are overused, they can become obstacles. And here's how that looks. Sometimes the, the obstacles is the high Ds because they are so focused on the outcome, they're perceived by people around them as being sometimes pretty insensitive, sometimes being pretty inconsiderate, you know, sometimes pretty domineering. I have worked with some very, very strong high Ds in my lifetime. And, and if you are a behavioral style that's more people or relationship oriented, the intensity of this can sometimes be a little difficult to be around. They can be impatient. They can come off as just being uptight that they just can't relax or, or, or very unforgiving, right? They can come off as unforgiving. It's not to say that they are, but it's how they're perceived because I think in many times they're so focused on the outcome and the task at hand that they're oblivious to the people involved, right? They can come off as cold and distant. They can come off as argumentative or opinionated or not complimentary, sometimes very possessive and try to get a high D to apologize for doing something wrong. Good luck. High Ds do not like to apologize. Right? That's kind of the nature of high Ds, right? And it's what happens when we overuse our strength 
in all situations. I see a light pop up in chat. Let me just take a look and see if there's a question there. Can we get a copy of these slides? Um, the answer is no, I can't give you a copy of this slide. This is copyright material from the Jackson, John Maxwell organization. So unfortunately, I can't give you that today. But um, I can probably find some other places where you can get some good stuff that I can share with you. All right. Anyway, that said, I want to give you a little short video here. Now, I'm going to um, put my volume up so that you can hear this. I'm hoping you can hear it as well as you can. I'm just going to ask you to kind of observe and to tell me who do you think is the high D in this org in this in this scene here? Who's going to be the high D? Let's listen up. Thank you all for sticking with it. This has been the worst quarter in the history of the lady scarf industry. Who knew it was going to be 80 plus degree weather most days? But I have it on high authority that the new CEO of our company is going to do great things. And I give you John Smith. Right, team. All right, team. I'm a no huddle offense kind of guy, so I'm cutting right to the chase. We're going to blitz the market with something brand new a line of socks. You're going to make it feel as fast as Deion Sanders, but you're going to look like prime time. We've got the ball, and we're ready to take it to the house. You, Nate. <laughs> All right, you name. It's Kim. Karen, can you picture this team in the red zone, ready to punch it in? It's Kim. I can too, Karen. I can too. That's why I've added something to sweeten the deal for everybody this quarter. That's right, my season tickets. We make gold this quarter. You're all going to tailgate with me on opening day. Now, who's got questions? No huddle, red zone. Do they sell scarves? Uh, those are sports metaphors. Okay. So you're not a football fan, are you? Let me, let me try doing this a different way. So at my last company, we were, we were a paper company. And I turned them into a paper and envelope company. It's a huge opportunity for us to do a ton of great things with a very similar product that complemented what we already did. That's what I see here. You guys are a scarf company. I know you have the expertise. I've seen your work. It's going to be a bit of a stretch. But together as a team, we can take our share of the sock market too. Now, who's with me? I think uh, we can all guess who was the high idea in that in that little video, right? Could you guys hear that okay? I, I, it's, uh, it's as loud as I can make that. I just want to make sure you can hear that all right. Have you ever been around somebody like that who is just communicating in a way that just seems so out of sync for the audience that it's just kind of not, it's just not connecting, right? And again, high Ds, high drivers, one of the hallmarks is that they're so focused on trying to achieve the objective that they can at times be oblivious to how that message is falling, how it's resonating. And, and, and again, I've worked with high Ds who say, hey, I'm the boss, people are just gonna have to learn it's my way or the highway or whatever it is. And what I'm gonna tell you is if you want to be a good communicator, you've got to take the golden rule. Remember the golden rule you learned in kindergarten? Who remembers what that is? Do unto others as what? Somebody unmute and tell me that you know the golden rule. As you want them to do unto you. As right. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's what we saw in the very first video, the very first part, when he expected people to adapt to his communication style. If you want to be effective in your communication, you've got to not take the golden rule. You've got to up it into what we call the platinum rule, which is do unto others, not as you would have them do unto you, do unto others as they want to be done unto. You've got to change your style to mesh with their communication needs. And when he recognized that nobody understood his sports metaphors, his football metaphors, he changed it up and suddenly communication happened, right? 
it's just a, a quick example of how that looks in, in, the, in the little video there, right? Uh, he was very aggressive at first. Great way to get people to not like you, says Ryan. Yeah, pretty true. Yeah, pretty true. You have a blank screen right now. I see. And now you're going to, oops, we're going to skip on to the next slide. Come on. I don't want to go through this again. Stick with me. There we go. Let's go on to the high eyes. They seek a friendly environment, right? They're relationship oriented. We remember that that grid. The high eyes are are outgoing and people oriented. They they want a relationship based um, environment. They can be very emotional, very animated. They can be great storytellers, very entertaining. They could be super encouraging. One of the things you're going to find in your market centers is that most, if not all of your team leaders are gonna be really high in the I department because a team leader's job is to be a great leader and an encourager and somebody who lifts people up. You know, what eyes look for is they treasure relationships and experiences with other people. You the biggest fear for the high eyes. It's this fear of rejection and, and loss of approval. They wanna be loved by everyone. Right? That's a hallmark of a high eye. And the strengths of the high eyes, they can be very persuasive. They can be very generous. They're, they can be charismatic, enthusiastic, very friendly, very talkative, maybe too talkative at times. They love to be in the spotlight. They're not just comfortable in it, but the higher the eye, they almost thrive to being in it. They're social, spontaneous, creative, likable, fun, all these different strengths. And again, when you have a strength that can be overused, it can become an obstacle. How does that play out for the eyes? Well, we know that they need to be in the spotlight all the time. But you know, sometimes the high eyes can come off as a little bit undisciplined. They can come off as at times a little disorganized. They can sometimes, because they are so optimistic, they always see the best in every situation, that sometimes they're taken as being a little bit naive. And, and they can sometimes appear to come off as a little bit phony. All that optimism can sometimes seem a little fake and a little phony. They can come off as distracted and, and sometimes, you know, forgetful. You know, one of the things, impulsivity comes in here sometimes with the high eyes, right? Now, I said they talk, and, and sometimes they talk way too much, so much that they don't get things done because it's all about just hanging and having fun with my friends and not paying attention to the tasks that need to be done. And sometimes that's perceived as being time wasters, you know, or, or they just don't listen because they're so interested in their perspective that they don't listen to others. That's why when you have a bad day, you bring it to the high S because they're great listeners, right? You know, a, a high I because their great fear of, of loss of approval and rejection, they have a hard time saying no to folks and they overcommit to everything. They wanna please everyone. So they take on everything. And when you take on everything, it makes it really hard to follow through. And sometimes high eyes are seen as, as great committers and terrible follow throughers and being very independable. That can be the downside. Of, of, a, of those strengths, which can be sometimes overused, right? Want to have another short little video here. You tell me, who do you think the high I in this group is here as we start this one? Let's listen up. Mary, got some more reports from procurement for you to process. To remind you office space, huh? Moving? PS reports? Is she too young for that, huh? Well, I was still in diapers when you were um, <laughs> getting back into diapers. Well, this old geezer could probably help you with those. You know all the codes by heart. Let me know. LMK. Sure. If I need help, I'll, um, you know. I do indeed. Hey Mary, I wonder if you could help me with something. Minecraft. Listen, Gary, I appreciate what you're doing, but I'm not 12 and I have reports to process. I'm just trying to get through to a friend. Get through to a friend? You know, that's a song lyric. 
Yeah. 20 pound sledge. They weren't down last week, you know. Yeah, I was there. But you weren't. This guy in the mosh pit. Oh my gosh, you're a legend. <laughs> Try telling that to my grandkids. <laughs> You know, John Maxwell says connectors connect on common ground. Um, you know, this is a great book that he came out with a number of years ago. It says everyone communicates, few connect, right? What we're always looking to do is try to find that common ground. Where do we have some point of connection here, right? And, and clearly we can see who was the high eye in, in that scenario. Let's move on to the next one here. Let's go talk a little bit, oops, about the S's, right? We talked about the S's as, as being great team members. They, they, they love a team environment. They're easygoing. They're laid back and agreeable. They're even paced. They're great listeners. 69% of the population leads with S. They're very compassionate folks. They treasure peaceful relationships, right? Some strengths of the high S include things like, well, before we go to the strengths, let me go on the biggest fear, actually. The greatest fear of the high S is loss of security and confrontation. They do not want to be in conflict with anyone. And they don't like things to be unpredictable. You know, we'll talk in, in a few moments about how to communicate with folks like this. But when we think about our, our clients, and we think about the disruption that happens in their lives when they're moving, which is just one of those great disruptive experiences in life, two thirds of the population, nearly 70%, high S personality behavioral styles, the loss of security is the greatest fear when we're communicating with them. How do we help them feel in control? How do we help them know that we are going to try to minimize the disruption in their lives? Because that's critical. The fear here is the loss of security and confrontation. They do not want any conflict with anyone. Here's the strengths. They're hard workers. They're great team players. They're stable, steady, secure. They can be very sentimental folks. They're reserved. They love close relationships. They can be very, very faithful. They're great listeners. They're great mediators. They find the easiest way to kind of get through things because they don't want any conflict. They're peaceful. They love routines. Very, very supportive. But these are the strengths of the high S's. And again, any strength that's overused can sometimes be an obstacle. The obstacles here can be that sometimes they can be seen as too laid back, that they're just kind of not assertive enough to get things done. Sometimes they're, they, they're seen as resisting change. They don't like things to be unpredictable. And so they, they kind of push back when we ask to, to uh, tolerate change. They sometimes are seen as needing things to go at a slower pace. They're sometimes slow to get things started because they don't want things to change. You know, they sometimes have a difficult time saying no to folks as well. Relationship people sometimes have a hard time saying no. They can need a lot of reassurance. They, they're not always all that direct, right? They shut down in confrontation. When confrontation starts, any kind of tension in the room, they zip it up. And you know what happens is the high Ds who have no trouble at all with conflict start to ask, hey, what's going on here? Is everybody good? I made anybody have any feedback for me? Anything like that? And the high S is feeling all of that conflict. Shut up. They shut down in conflict. They can be very sarcastic as a result. They can be very sarcastic. You know, they can be possessive. They can be a little skeptical or come off that way. They can come off as being indecisive and just not willing to speak up. And so the strengths, when overused for the S's, can sometimes create obstacles. Let's move on to the C's, right? The C's are like an environment that is logical. These are the folks who are task oriented. These are the folks who are more reserved. We call them compliance. They're, they seek, they, they're conscientious, they're accurate, they're detail oriented. They want things to be perfect. And the biggest fear of the high C's is criticism. It's criticism for making a mistake. They do not want to be criticized and they do not want to make a mistake. And so if you look at the strengths, they're great analysts. 
they're they're genius prone. A lot of the high C's, right? They're self sacrificing. They're idealistic. Their high work quality is off the chain. They're organized. They're loyal. They're logical. They're persistent. They're great planners. They finish what they start before they move on to something else. They're data driven. They're deep thinkers. They're serious, and they get things done right. C's are great to have around, but like anything else, a strength over use can become an obstacle. They can sometimes come off as being a bit moody, a little critical, sometimes a bit rigid or legalistic. They can sometimes come off as being hard to please because they hold everyone else up to their own standard of perfection. They're sometimes hard to, to please that way, right? Um, they can see, be seen as overanalyzing. And, and you know, when it comes to taking action, if the high Ds, the drivers are ready, fire, aim, it's just like, just do it. We'll figure it out as we go. The high Cs are the exact opposite. They are ready, aim, 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 adjust your sights one more time. The high Ds are like, would you fire already? You're making me nuts here, right? And so this, and then finally, because the Cs will analyze it to death because they are so concerned about getting it wrong, right? They can sometimes come off as, um, you know, uh, a little socially insecure. They prefer to work alone. And because of that, sometimes they're seen as a little bit aloof or maybe a little socially insecure. Um, they avoid taking risks. They're, they're slow to get things started. They could be over analysis paralysis here. They may not always see the big picture because they're so caught up in the details. Whereas the I's and the D's are so caught up in the big picture that they would do well to pay a little bit more attention to the details, right? So I've got one more little video snippet here that I wanna share with you. And let's take a look and see who's the high C here. Last delivery to our client promised an arrival time of 2 p.m. 2.04 is not 2 p.m. I expect excellence from every member of our team, and I'm going to experience that excellence moving forward. Am I right? Very good. Wow. She's so organized. It's going to save me hours. Days. Kim Miller to Ricky Ford's office. Kim Miller, report to my office. Oh, she hates the reports. 204 is not 2 p.m. I expect excellence from every member Oh, man. I can't afford to lose this job. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Get it together, Kim. I gave her what she wanted. Okay, I mean, take a leg in the toe. You can do this. Kim Miller, report to Ricky Ford's office immediately. These are awesome. You paged? Kim, I sincerely can't believe the quality of this work. I, did you do this? Yeah. This is really, really good. I couldn't have done it better myself. Oh, oh. did I miss something? I, I thought you were going to fire me. <laughs> you're so particular and really and fire, No, Kim, oh, how could I fire the woman that single-handedly saved me days of work and may have set the bar for our department and how we do our reporting? No, I was going to compliment you, thank you, and talk to you about how to teach this to others, how to deliver like this as manager of the department. Uh, but our department doesn't have a manager, though. It does now. Congratulations. You know, the saga of the high D boss and the high C employee. And um, it's amazing how often the high C's can really misinterpret, right? 
and feel so intimidated. But in this scenario, it's just another example of, of how communication can be misinterpreted if you don't understand the behavioral stylus, right? So, so let's talk about this a minute. John says that, you know, connecting increases your influence in every situation. So what do we need to do, right? Let, well, let me start by asking you this. Anybody have one of these Alexa devices in your house where you can kind of say, hey, Alexa, turn on the light switch. Hey, Alexa, do something, right? Does anybody have one of these? I actually don't because uh, I'm a little weirded out by that. But my daughter has one. Turn on the light, Alexa. Hey, Alexa, what time is it in Bangladesh? You know, and it doesn't matter because when you speak, it understands and it performs the task. It doesn't matter who asks. It doesn't matter how they ask because it's programmed to respond to every single person the same way. Human beings are not that way. We need to connect in a human way. This is where we have to kind of really leverage the platinum rule, do unto others as they want to be done unto, because communication is about what? Communication is about influence. Communication is about motivation. It's about how we express our feelings to each other, how we inform each other. I have always said that communication in sales is to do two key things, to get people to make a decision and to act on that decision. Right, and so we have to figure out how do we adjust our styles to other folks' styles so that we can be more impactful. So if you are communicating with a high D, if you're communicating with a high D, what you need to do is you need to be brief, briefer. You got to get right to the point. This is not a person that's going to want you to chat them up. This is not a person in a listing appointment that you're going to go into and start to talk about how great the weather is today and start to admire the pictures of their grandkids and talk about the, the trip that they went on to. They're going to be like, look, don't take advantage of my time, right? Get to the point. Ask a lot of questions that are what and how questions because what and how questions allow them to be the expert. The Ds want to take charge and they want to, they want to kind of flaunt that. Would they, you want to focus on results. You, you do not want to ramble. Get to the point. Discuss a problem and the impact and the effect that it's going to have on the outcome that they want. But always be talking solution oriented. When you're talking to Ds, it's get to the point, be solution based, and let's not get into any of the touchy feely stuff. Now, the high eyes, on the other hand, very much the other way. The high eyes don't want you to do all the talking because who's it about? They want to be the ones doing the talking. And so give them a space to talk. This is the listing appointment where you're going to come in and you're going to talk about, you know, what's going on and, and how exciting it is for them to be, you know, getting ready to move or to buy a house. And, and you're going to get them to kind of talk about what's involved. Give them time for this kind of social interaction. Because the high eyes can be a little bit disorganized. You're going to need anything that's important that's detail-oriented. You're going to need to follow up with writing. Do not expect them to remember it. Do not expect them to take good notes. You're going to need to follow up in writing. In fact, you might find that um, shorter communications, like four 10-minute interactions, is probably better for a high eye than one 40-minute interaction right? You're going to want to help them see how the things that they're doing, the decisions that they're making are going to be valued by other people and the impact that's going to be made because what they're looking for all the time in the high eyes is they want that social recognition, the social approval, you know? And so, and so make sure that they can see how what they're doing is going to be valued by other people. Let's look at the S's. Provide uh, the S's. You're going to need to. You're, you're going to need to create an environment that's really friendly and laid back and kind of chill. They don't want any sense of conflict, any sense of pressure. They do not respond well to the hard driving, stereotypical salesperson. And one of the things that happens is a lot of folks who go into sales as a profession tend sometimes to lead with that driven, outgoing personality. The high S's don't always do well with that. So be aware of that. Show interest in them as a person. Don't be overly aggressive. Minimize any potential for confrontation. Minimize any potential for uncertainty. The biggest fear is for uncertainty here. So all of the communication with them is how we've got a plan, how we've got systems, how we're going to make sure that things are minimized in, in, in any way that would cause them stress, right? Give them time to adjust for changes. They're not great at making decisions on the fly. That, that require them to do things differently. 
And so, and so you're going to need to kind of give a little bit more time sometimes for the essence or they're going to feel pushed. And because they're not ones to be able to push back because they don't like confrontation, they're going to shut down and then they're going to get really snarky behind your back. <laughs> That's kind of the way it works sometimes with the S's. Communicating with a high C, the detail-oriented folks, make sure you give them all the details, but make sure that your details are accurate, that you can validate them because they are going to check. They're going to ask you to vet your facts. If you give them any kind of statistics about your market share or your office's market share, you better be able to prove it because if you're starting to inflate your stats a little bit, that is a cardinal sin to the high C's. Be precise in your explanations. Be very specific but also be patient. Answer all their questions. They too are gonna to need a little bit more time. Follow up in it with any additional data that they, they ask for. But these are just some sort of tips in terms of, of how you should communicate with folks. Now, a lot of times people ask me in the couple of minutes that we've got here, a lot of times people ask me, how do I know whether I'm talking to a D or an I or an S or a C? Well, when we go back into this, what we were talking about before the behaviors and we started to describe those, you begin to start to see those patterns. You start to see people that come off as a little bit more aggressive. Those are your Ds. They come off as a little bit more talkative and self-centered. Those are your eyes. But there's a quick hack that I learned. I think I learned it actually at Mega Camp, Kayla Williams Mega Camp, where one of the panelists on stage had a series of questions that she asked people. Four simple questions that I think can give you a quick hack on what you're, what you're looking at. And here's what they are. She says, if your best friend was asked to define and describe you and they could use only one way, only one of these options, which would it be? Are you all about business? Are you the life of, par of the party? Is it friends and families first for you? or just show me the facts. Those are your four choices. Is it all about business? Are you the life of the party? Is it relationships, family and friends first? Or just show me the facts. And, and how people answer that corresponds pretty neatly with all about business are the, are the Ds, um, the life of the party are the Is, family and friends first are the Ss, show me the facts are the Cs. I have seen people incorporate that question in pre-listing materials that they will send out and say, I'm gonna ask you this question, pick one, we'll talk about it when I get there. And when you see what they've decided or how they see themselves, it gets you an opportunity to think about how am I gonna tailor my communication to be more effective with them, right? So when you are, aware of these things, you build better relationships, you build better rapport. You know, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, what is the best style? Like, what's the best style for sales? What's the best style for somebody to be a good negotiator or somebody to be a good teacher or somebody to be a good leader? What is the best? And the truth of the matter is, your style is the best style. There is no right, wrong style. It's, it's can you come and play from your strengths we go back to those behavioral strengths that we outlined. Can you be aware that sometimes those strengths that are overused or used in the wrong context can create problems or obstacles for you? Can you come with that awareness, but your style is the best style? Anybody can be an effective communicator. Anybody can be effective in sales. Anybody can be effective in leadership or whatever it is okay. if you play from your own strengths and you minimize those, those obstacles, right? So when in the very beginning, when we started this exercise and I said, try to find all the numbers, go one, two, three, four, what we found was when we could divide that up into quadrants and we knew what to expect, we knew the one would be in the upper right, the two in the, up, uh, the one in the upper left rather, the two in the upper right, when we knew what to expect, it was easier to complete the task. When we know what patterns we're looking for, it's easier for us to kind of know what to do next. And it's the same in relationships. It's the same in communication. When we know what to expect, we know how to adjust to connect at a deeper level, to communicate at a higher level, to build stronger relationships and ultimately to have better outcomes. 
So with that, I did hit the one hour mark here. Anybody have any takeaways, any ahas, any light bulb things that went on in your head? Anything speak to you from what we've talked about today? Just unmute yourself and let's just have a quick chat for a minute. You see the value of kind of getting familiar with this stuff? Great class, how I learned a lot. Um, I feel like I want to pick up um, from each one of them um, and, you know, the posit, the positive, you know, qualities, I guess. And, uh, and it depends upon what kind of customer you or client you have and you um, work accordingly. Sometimes, you know, you talk to FISPOs and they don't want to talk about general stuff and um, they don't want to talk about their family or anything they want to you to talk to them to the point mm -hmm. so you work accordingly with the situation I feel yeah Peru you're, you're hitting on something important and it's context right these we have these natural behavioral styles when when you said before that you want to pick up on all the strengths you want to be aware that everyone has strengths right you want to make sure that you play from your own style Right, my style is high IS, off the chart, almost IS. And I know that that style, if you really get into it, I, I know what the strengths are of that style and I know what the limitations are of that style, right? You always wanna play from your strengths and recognize the strengths in others, for sure, absolutely. And the context though, you know, go back to the elevator example, right? You, 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 it's the context of the elevator that changes the way you may behave. You know, sometimes driving a car, when you get in the car, the car is an environment. The environment can shape your behavioral style. There are sometimes people who are kind of laid back and chill. When you get them in their car and they're driving on the Garden State Parkway, it's like they are aggressive as all get out, right? Because the environment is the car. And then they park the car and they get out and they're all laid back and chill again. It's amazing how... This is not static across the board. We're not putting people in boxes necessarily. The context that we're in can sometimes change the way these behaviors look, but all of these styles have strengths and there's not one right. Any other ahas or takeaways that anybody had from today? I want to say how, um, for me, the aha moment is that, you know, everyone communicates, but very few connect. So our aim is to try and connect with people based on all that you shared. Thank you so much. It was wonderful information. You know what they say, nobody cares what you know until they know you care, right? And, and as basic as that is, one of the primal ways that you show that you care about people is that you, you pay attention and you care enough to connect with them in a way that makes them feel comfortable. Right. And, it, and if it means you have to adapt yourself to do that, then that's what you have to do. That's what great communication, that's what great leaders do. They don't expect people to mold to them. Right. 